Good evening. And I'm sorry that I am uh, not necessarily in my best voice. Uh, I had COVID about a month ago, and so I'm still recovering. And so I'm, uh, I'm mic'd up on my mask. I've got a microphone in my hand. Hopefully everybody can hear me, regardless of where you are. Um, my topic tonight is to talk about governor's councils as judicial bodies. And in early America, um, before we even get there, I want to start by saying that the reason why I'm talking about this now tonight is so that you guys can understand better how it is that our justice system is not fixed. Our justice system has always been in motion and has always been changing over time. And so tonight I'm going to be talking about elements of justice that you probably think just sound weird. Uh, if not downright crazy. But this is in fact how justice was delivered in early America. And so the connection to We Talk is to basically point out that justice and how it's delivered in our country has changed over time. And change over time is what historians love. We love talking about that. Okay, so in early America, governors called upon their councils for expert advice, nominated locally, but usually appointed by the king or queen to their positions, council members gave governors the benefit of their experience and their local influence. Council members, governor's council members acted as legislators. They functioned everywhere except in Pennsylvania as an upper house of the legislature. So they're doing executive business. They're serving as a part of the legislature and they also had judicial duties as well, which is what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Um, governor's Council switched tasks seamlessly between what we would think of today as executive or legislative or judicial. What we today would think of as a kind of weirdo blending of the different branches of government, they took as perfectly normal for those to be done by the same people. The physical records of their activities bear this out. They reflect this melding of tasks. The record books that exist show how they'd be doing something that we would think of as executive one moment and then switch gears to do stuff that was judicial another moment. This intermixing of records sort of explains why governor's councils very little has been written about them as judicial bodies. People who've read these records have tended to focus on the executive or the legislative aspects of what governor's councils did. Um, and basically, um, the, the best work that's looked at this has been done by a guy named Joseph Smith, who wrote in the 1950s, and others who were looking at how people might try to appeal a case from a decision made by the governor and council as a judicial body to the Privy Council in England for one final hearing. If the colonist had enough money to pull that off, because it's obviously an expensive process, and also if the colony permitted it. And permitting the appeal is part of what I'll be talking about this evening as well. So I've been working on governor's uh, council books now for some time as part of this research project that Linda described um, the book that I'm co-writing with Mava Marcus on the earliest Supreme Court and its forerunners, the forebears that came to it from England and from the colonies in the 17th and 18th centuries. And so tonight I'm going to be talking about governor's councils and in particular the kinds of judicial jobs that they did, including some stuff that's connected to what we today would call judicial review. That's an anachronistic term. They never used it, but that's the term we know. So the combination of um, different activities means that when we look at governor's councils from the colonial period of America, we see this mushing together of executive, legislative, and judicial work. The individuals who served on the governor's councils were typically people of high wealth, high status. They typically had great local influence. They were often big landholders. Uh, if, they, if they lived in the right location, they might have a lot of slave, slave labor. Um, and being named as a counselor was a great honor. 
And typically someone, once they were appointed, would continue to serve until they died. So these are typically individuals in middle age all the way through late age. Um, late age, by the way, isn't very long because the average lifespan is still only about 37. So some people live to be in their 60s or 70s, but some people die very young in this world. They share many responsibilities with the governor and range over, like what I said, executive, legislative, and judicial types of duties. To them, it was all the same. It was about administering the colony, making sure that the colony and its government ran for the people. Now, this also meant that they were not just serving as advisors to the governor, but they're also serving as judges. Um, typically, the people who served as governor's council members would be appointed also to serve as a judge on whatever highest court of appeal existed in a colony. Um, and what's also weird, they might also serve as judges in a lower court as well. And so you can get instances where um, a, a counselor or a governor's counselor might have heard a case at the county level, and then that, that decision gets appealed to the governor and council where the same guy is sitting. So he might hear it twice. And this is, in fact, what happened in the seven, same thing happened in the 1790s that justices on the Supreme Court, when they wrote on circuit, could hear a case at a lower level, and then that case might be appealed to the Supreme Court and they might hear it again. And so they would effectively have two shots at implementing their, their vision of what justice was. So this is something that carries over into the 1790s. The convergence of all this authority in this one group that you're thinking, how did I never hear about these guys before? The convergence of all this power and authority imitated an institution in England called the Privy Council. From the Middle Ages all the way up through the 1600s, 1700s, the Privy Council had attended the king as his personal set of advisors. They were um, to advise him on matters of state, and as late as the 1640s, they also could serve as judges in what was called the Court of Star Chamber. Now, that judicial body, the Star Court of Star Chamber, came to an end in 1641 because of particular abuses connected to the life and times of Charles, King Charles I, and we won't go into all of the different things that Charles did to abuse the power of the Court of Star Chamber. But basically, um, Parliament put a stop to uh, what Charles's government did in the Court of Star Chamber and basically said the Privy Council could never serve as a Court of Star Chamber ever again. Here's the, the, the piece of the law from 1641. Be it likewise declared and enacted by authority of the present Parliament that neither His Majesty nor His Privy Council have or ought to have any jurisdiction, power, or authority by bill, petition, article, libel, or any other arbitrary way whatsoever to examine or draw into question, determine or dispose of lands of people that could normally be disposed of through regular course of justice. That basically the, the Star Chamber is put out of business. That um, if you had any sort of dispute, it ought to be tried and determined by ordinary courts of justice. So the Privy Council is put out of the judicial business permanently. Um, as a result, the Privy Council in England stopped hearing appeals from courts in England itself. But they did continue to hear appeals, sometimes, from other parts of the empire, outside of England, like the Channel Islands, Jersey and Guernsey, or the Isle of Man, or the northern part of Ireland, um, places like Gibraltar, uh, East India, and so on all parts of the empire that England control. But the irony here is the Privy Council can no longer hear appeals that come to it from cases inside of England, only from outside of England. Now, complicating um, all of this is the fact that in America, over in the colonies, there's an absence of, of structure that is commonplace in England. So for example, there are no ecclesiastical courts Ecclesiastical courts exist in England to determine whether a marriage is valid or can be dissolved. They determine how probate is handled when somebody dies, what happens to all of their belongings. Um, and there's no 
There are no ecclesiastical courts in early America. So who's supposed to handle those problems? Um, same thing's true about admiralty. In England, there are admiralty courts. If there's a dispute about um, a, a boat, a ship that's run aground and has salvage, or a dispute about uh, sailors' wages, all of that can be resolved in an admiralty court. The only problem is in the colonies, we don't have any. Not in the 1660s or for most of the time that I'm talking about. Um, and this is also true for something called equity. Um, equity jurisdiction was um, that something that grew up alongside the common law courts as an alternative system by which people could get justice in England. The colonies didn't necessarily have equity courts, this parallel court system. So in each of these cases, in each of these situations, governors might or might not decide to create these new courts. And they could just put them into existence like that. Because, well, it's good to be a royal governor. Um, uh, for ecclesiastical justice, the Privy Council said, you governors are supposed to handle probate and marriage licenses. Now imagine this, if you're a colonist, you're going to go to the governor to get a marriage license. Um, in the case of admiralty, governors could resolve all sorts of problems relating to ships and sailors. And the same thing's true about equity. But governors sometimes ran into a problem in that their governor's councils sometimes did want to have courts of equity and sometimes didn't. So in, an example in New York is um, when a new governor showed up, he would ask the, his council members, do you think we should have a court of equity? And in two different times in New York, the councilor said no. No, we don't really need one. We're, we're good. And then the governor went ahead and created one anyhow. You might say, well, why? And the answer is money, fees, right? This is a way for a governor to generate another revenue stream. So he could do this because his royal instructions from the crown gave him that power. He'd been really nice. He'd ask the counselors, do you think we need one? Probably assuming that they'd want to say yes and was kind of surprised when they said no. Um, colonial assembly people generally didn't like these prerogative courts, the equity courts, the admiralty courts, and whatnot, because they operated without juries. They operated simply with a single judge, or sometimes maybe a, a, a bank of judges, but no juries. There's no jury in an equity court. There's no jury in an admiralty court. So assemblies kept looking for ways, these colonial legislatures kept looking for ways to try to derail judicial business out of the hands of governors and into their own hands. So for example, the South Carolina Legislative Assembly in the 1720s actually put an Englishman, uh, a guy with a title, Landgrave Thomas Smith, on trial for alleged treason. And the governor was like, how dare you do that? Uh, you've overstepped your authority. The same thing happened a few years later. The South Carolina Assembly tried to strip the governor and council of their ability to use equity jurisdiction. They simply passed a law saying you can't do this. Which, of course, it was right in the royal instructions and they said, of course, the governor had that authority. Um, there were all kinds of efforts like this to push judicial business, either point it towards a governor and council or point it towards a legislature. What we would think of today is drawing judicial business into places that look very strange compared to what we know of the modern day. So Rhode Island's legislature had a double title. It wasn't just a legislature, it was also a court of chancery and equity. So Rhode Island's legislature called itself that and it survived a long time because of Rhode Island's very unusual charter, the document that allowed them to exist as a colony. Um, but we'll come back to Rhode Island in a bit. In any case, equity and all of these other courts are problematic because they only exist as long as the governor's in town. If the governor dies or the governor leaves his colony, those courts disappear. He's the source of authority that allows them to exist. So there's no provision for, say, council members or somebody else to actually serve as a tribunal if he's gone or has died. Okay, so 
Let me just move ahead and talk a little bit about um, how people in Massachusetts responded to um, a, a problem in their colony. Colonies tried, oftentimes the legislatures tried, to limit appeals that would be made to the Privy Council. And this is, this is the first example of this that we can find uh, historically is in Massachusetts. Uh, but New England as a whole is really kind of a problematic area for this. In 1634, Charles I, Charles, uh, who was later put out of business in 1641, he's actually the Charles who got beheaded. This is why the name of being, having Charles as a name for a king is always problematic. Um, I think Charles III is trying to rehabilitate the name because uh, Charles's don't do too well in English history. So in any case, in 1634, Charles I issued an order that men on his privy council were to look into affairs in Massachusetts because something was odd was happening there in terms of its judicial business. Whether that meant that they could look into the affairs of any colony, that's unclear. But definitely they could look into Massachusetts. And what was going on there were a series of trials where certain people in Massachusetts were being banished or were having all of their belongings uh, confiscated by the colony. Um, in particular, here's an example. Um, uh, John Wheelwright was convicted by a Massachusetts court in the 1630s of having um, religiously heretical beliefs, and so he was banished. And he wanted to appeal his sentence to the Privy Council. So he asked the court in Massachusetts, which was made up of the governor and his counselors and members of the legislature, if he could appeal to the Privy Council in England. And in 1637, they said, no, you can't appeal. The, the, the last appeal is to us. And he was told that no appeal lay outside of Massachusetts whatsoever. And the reasoning that the governor and the members of the legislature gave him was that the language of the charter that Massachusetts had that put them in business as a colony prevented any appeal outside of Massachusetts itself. Now, the guys in Massachusetts know that this is kind of a shaky ground kind of claim. And so in the 1640s, they dispatch a guy named uh, Edward Winslow to petition the commissioners for foreign plantations, that's what a colony was called, a plantation, to accept the colonial interpretation that the Massachusetts guys had put on it, that no appeals could be made for judicial business outside of Massachusetts. And indeed, the commissioners for foreign plantations in England bought the argument. They actually said, yeah, we agree with you. No appeals should happen. Here's the language the commissioners used when they wrote to Edward Winslow in May of 1647 saying, yeah, we sign off on this. We thought it necessary for preventing a further inconveniences of this kind, hereby to declare that we intended not to encourage any appeals from your justice. So effectively saying, we here in England, we're not gonna look into your judicial decisions. But the commissioners for foreign plantations are not the Privy Council. And the Privy Council may or may not share that same opinion. So if by now you're kind of convinced it's a bit of a muddle, and there's actually a lot of uh, gray involved in trying to understand, well, could they appeal a case, or could they appeal, couldn't they appeal a case, and which courts are there? You're right. That's right. Um, it is a bit of a muddle in the middle of the 17th century. And colonies in North America each had different language in their colonial charters about the system of justice they were supposed to use. In Rhode Island, which got its charter in 1663, there was a specific clause that said a right of appeal to England existed in cases of boundary disputes. And the people in Rhode Island wanted that inserted, that clause inserted into their charter because they had an ongoing boundary dispute with Massachusetts. But what's interesting is it doesn't say that appeals will exist for any other type of cause, any other type of dispute. So they clearly wanted to be able to appeal a type of case that might favor them, but they don't want to have every type of Tom, Dick, and Harry sort of lawsuit to be able to be appealed back to England. 
The charter given briefly to, to Maine, there was a colony that was set up in Maine by a guy named Gorgias, G-O-R-G-E-S, in 1664, likewise had language in it that offered a limited right of appeal from the colonies. So what we have is some colonies that have no language in their charter saying a right of appeal exists to England. And in other colonies, we have language that spells out only particular types of cases can be appealed back to England. And then we have other colonies like Massachusetts and Connecticut that have no language about appeals overseas, back to England, back to the Privy Council. And the question is, how are we supposed to interpret that silence? How did the colonists interpret that silence and how did the people in England interpret that silence? Now, now I'm gonna tell you a story about Connecticut and this is really the, the rest of the talk, is what happened in the Connecticut dispute. Um, in colonial Connecticut, obstructing appeals back to the Privy Council reached its high watermark. It's absolutely the most extreme version that I know of from all of colonial history. In 1662, Connecticut got a new colonial charter and that charter laid out how appeals, what the court system looked like in Connecticut and what those appeals were supposed to look like. A court case could start at the county level and then if you didn't like the outcome, you could appeal from the county to the court of assistance. And the court of assistance was made up of the governor and six of his council members. And if you didn't like that outcome, you could appeal from the court of assistance to the General Assembly. The General Assembly, which is also made up of a whole bunch of people who are elected, plus the governor and his counselors, all of them. And if you didn't like that, too bad. Because that's the three stages of justice that were spelled out in the Connecticut Charter. Okay, so this is um, the situation in Connecticut. So the wording of this 1662 charter leaves open the possibility that appeals stop with the General Assembly and can't go to the Privy Council. So there's, there's no mention of the Privy Council in there anywhere. Connecticutians, um, they're also sometimes called Connecticuters, uh, thought that silence meant there wasn't any right. And for nearly 30 years, they were correct. There were no appeals tried to get to the Privy Council for 30 years, from the 1660s till we get to the 1690s. So here's the case that changed it all. The first appeal to the Privy Council from Connecticut arose out of a will, a contested will made by a man named John Levine. John Levine died, he signed the will and then he died in 1689. And he left the bulk of his estate, which included a ship called the Levine, because he named the ship after himself, left uh, all the bulk of his estate to the Congregational Church of New London. So the church got the bulk of everything. And he left really token amounts to his two stepsons, two guys who were born to his wife by her first husband. They'd, bo they'd been born in Barbados. Two guys named John and Nicholas Hallam. So the Hallams are not, they're the stepsons of the Levine guy who's dead. So the will is probated and the Hallams object. They say, he was nuts. The will is wrong. We shouldn't listen to this. The, 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 the money should be ours. The ship should be ours. And they lose. Um, they lost. So they're going to have to wait for another opportunity to contest the will. And in the meantime, they go to auction and they buy the Levine when the congregational church sells it. This is going to turn out to be important later on. So when their mother dies, 10 years later, they use the fact that they're inheriting her money as an opportunity to say, we need to go back and look at his will and put his will through probate again. It was a mistake. He was crazy. The division of property was wrong. It should have come to us through our mother's uh, inheritance, if not ours directly. And so they basically open this up again 10 years later. So they go to the county court to make a suit about this. County court says, nope, you're wrong. At which point, the Hallams then register a complaint with the court of assistance. You'll recall court of assistance is the governor and six of his counselors. So they register a complaint saying the county court got it wrong. The court of assistance rejects their complaint, 
saying, we can only listen if you appeal the decision. You just complained about it. That's not the same thing. You have to appeal. Do it technically right, we'll listen to your suit. Whereupon the Hallams completely jump the line and say, we want an appeal to the Privy Council. They're not going to listen, they're not going to appeal it through the Court of Assistance, they're not going to appeal it to the General Assembly, they want to jump all the way to the Privy Council. The governor and assistants basically say, no, you can't have this right of, we're not giving you this appeal. The Hallams have really very little to lose, right? They didn't inherit the first time, they haven't inherited the second time, and they're outsiders. They're from Barbados. They think they're probably getting rooked, right, by these Connecticut people. And so they don't care if they appeal to England and make Connecticut look bad. Connecticut's not really their home. Okay, so they go to, they manage to get a hearing before the Board of Trade in 1699 about whether or not they should be, have the right of an appeal to the Privy Council. And this particular hearing before the Board of Trade is kind of interesting because there are two other cases from two other colonies that raise exactly the same issue in the same hearing. One's from South Carolina and one's from Rhode Island. And it kind of smells a little of a put-up job. It looks to me like maybe they, people have been fishing for these kinds of lawsuits that are contested and they're bringing them all together to try to raise the same issue. Can a colony prevent, block appeals to the Privy Council. Um, are these manufactured disputes? Possibly. Have these people been sought out and asked to contest them? Possibly. An English observer, Sir Henry Ashurst, later came to think that these appeals, in his words, had been cunningly timed to, concede, to coincide. Okay, so Sir Henry Ashurst is hired by the Connecticut government to go to this Board of Trade meeting and talk about their reasons for why no appeal to the Privy Council should exist. So Ashurst makes his argument to the Board of Trade about Connecticut saying everything. He pulls out the stops. He makes every argument he possibly can that there should be no right of appeal to Connecticut. He talks about first, it's not in the charter. The charter spells out what the court system of justice is supposed to look like. The Privy Council is not listed. They talk about the fact that for 30 years, there's been no appeal. If this is a route that people could use, why haven't people been using it before? For 30 years, no case has actually been appealed. They talk about the fact that the Hallams didn't follow the right procedure. They went from the county government to registering a complaint to wanting to talk to the Privy Council. They, they jumped over a lot of steps they should have used. And basically, Ashurst says, last of all, well, one of his last arguments is, Connecticut disputes ought to stay in Connecticut. Connecticut disputes have no business being heard in England. As he put it, the distance of the place seems to make it in some measure necessary that all causes be finally determined there. For should the common course of justice be by way of appeal to this kingdom, meaning England, the expense must inevitably be great whatever the value of the cause and the circumstance of the party who prosecutes or defend it, and the event will be that the poor will be hereby oppressed. Taking yourself or taking documents or witnesses to England is expensive. And this is gonna cut off justice. And moreover, he then reminded the Englishman, you know, sea travel is dangerous. People do die on the North Atlantic. The hazarding of deeds and evidences as well as the lives of witnesses upon the seas is an inconvenience. And basically he said, look, there are parts of England where when the county court reaches a decision, you cut off appeals to the king. We should be able to do the same thing that those counties do. Ashurst didn't win. The Board of Trade said, yes, there should be some kind of appeal. Even though they thought the Hallams had a really weak case, they said even though it do not appear evident unto us by any proofs that the, the Hallams had been wronged, they thought that a right of appeal existed. And so, Upon filing this, basically, um, Connecticut people, when they receive this, the legislature writes and says, really kind of misleadingly, almost insincerely, we could not possibly be more happy than to have all such differences as arise amongst us 
to be heard and determined by his majesty's great wisdom. You know, we would love to have the king solve all of our problems. But, of course, it would be prejudicial and almost wholly ruinous to his subjects here because of the cost, the distance, and the danger. They pointed out that the charter granted them power over their own courts, and um, then basically the Hallams show up and start demanding more court time, more court proceedings. And so in 1700, the Hallams turn up in front of the Connecticut General Assembly, and um, they try to gain information. They appear, they make all the arguments that they've got. The assembly, sitting as the highest court of appeal in the colony of Connecticut, rejects all of these arguments as we kind of expect they would. And after that, the Hallams ask the General Assembly for the right to appeal to the Privy Council. And you can guess what the General Assembly said. No. You cannot have an appeal to the Privy Council. And so the Hallams then go back to England and petition to be heard. Anyhow, and they point out something that you and I have already seen and thought about. They point out in their petition that the governor and his council members are sitting in the legislature. And so having heard the case once, there's an obvious overlap in their duties, what we would think of as a separation of powers issue. They say, these people shouldn't be there. This has been common practice, but the Hallams pointed out first no appeals, and they say that, that the governor had actually said in open court that no appeals should exist, or that there would be, he would basically fight the, the crown on all of this. Anyway, finally, the Board of Trade says, yes, an appeal can be made to the Privy Council. The king has an inherent right to hear appeals from all of his subjects, regardless of location, and regardless of what the charter does or doesn't say. So the Hallams gather their evidence, they go to the Privy Council, and they lose. And they lose because the Privy Council says, if you were so sure that justice was on your side, you shouldn't have bought the ship Levine at the auction. And because you bought the ship, that means that you thought the probate was done correctly. Too bad. You lose. So they lost after, on all of these appeals. I mean, this is hugely expensive, what they've been doing. The very next day, the Hallams deliver a petition on behalf of two other people, John and Samuel Mason, a petition that had been drawn up four months earlier and that just happened to be sitting in their pockets to the Board of Trade. And in that petition, what they say is that the General Assembly of Connecticut has been abusing the Mohegan Indians by effectively cheating them on their land deals, setting off literally a chain of meetings, uh, hearings, appeals, commissions, that's gonna stretch all the way from 1704 to 1773. It's one of the longest, most complex pieces of litigation that happens in all of colonial America. Now, the Mohegan case against Connecticut is rightly thought of as the first Native American lawsuit uh, brought on behalf of the land rights of Native peoples. But isn't it interesting that just the day after the Hallams lose, that they just happen to have a petition to file in front of the Board of Trade saying Connecticut has abused all of these poor, luckless Native Americans in their land dealings. Basically, the Hallams, this is the grudge match, and they were going to win the return bout against the Connecticut people. They have nothing to lose, and so they're going to basically keep suing until the Connecticut people lose. So, what are we to make of these examples of counselors, governor's counselors, engaging in judicial business, or colonial assemblies diverting judicial business their way, or assemblies in several colonies, like Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, trying to block appeals of lawsuits to the Privy Council? Well, the first and most obvious conclusion one might reach is Justice, the system of justice is not obvious in the colonial world. It's not clear where somebody with a grievance should start their lawsuit. Maybe you go to a county court. Maybe you file something in the equity court. Maybe you go to the governor and council by filing some kind of petition. But it's not at all obvious where lawsuits are supposed to be heard. 
Um, you know, this could be confusing a little bit if you're a colonist. Where do I go to get justice in this system? Um, the road to the county courthouse is not quite as obvious to them as it is to us. Um, today, the word that lawyers use to describe this is forum shopping. Forum shopping is when somebody who has a dispute, a claim, looks around and says, who's the best judge for me to get the outcome I want? The best judge to get the outcome I want. And there's a case going on right now in Florida that pulls on this whole idea of forum shopping. We think of forum shopping as something that we only do in our time. But it's very clear when you look at the strategy that the Hallams used, that the Hallams think they can get a better hearing from the Privy Council than they can from Connecticut men who don't like them. Okay, so the second thing that ought to stand out to us as we think about this whole body of information is that colonial governments were really quite commonly trying to block appeals to England. They were trying to cut off and restrict their own citizens from appealing for justice back to the king or back to the Privy Council. You know, Massachusetts uh, had done this, Rhode Island had done this, Connecticut had done this, and resisting any kind of oversight is almost a, an act of faith for people who were colonists in this, era, in this era. Many of them left England to get away from these people, to get away from English justice, to be able to run their own lives in colonial America. For many of them, that's why they braved the North Atlantic to get to the New World. So, you know, we have to wonder whether or not this is a widespread sort of behavior, not just to two or three colonies I've mentioned, but a lot of them. And we've got some evidence that suggests it was a widespread problem. When we look at governor's instructions from the 1670, the, the directions that they got from the crown before they took their new job, governors who were headed to Jamaica, Virginia, Barbados, Bermuda, and the Leeward Islands in the Caribbean were warned only to allow appeals to go to the governor or governor and counselor, counselors alone, not to allow appeals to go through the legislature. So the Privy Council is trying to tell governors, we want appeals to be funneled towards you as governor and, and your assistants. And this was uh, instructions that were again repeated in the 1680s and 90s to governors headed to Maryland and New Hampshire and Virginia. And so what's clear, I think, from this is that colonial assemblies, these legislatures, were trying to get into what we would think of as judicial business and make themselves the last arbiters of justice. Okay, so third we might ask ourselves, why did they think they were gonna get away with it? Why did these colonists think that nobody was gonna step up and say, you're kidding, right? Um, it seems to me that many of them thought they'd get away with it because of distance. This was the argument that the guys in Connecticut made. This is the argument that Sir Henry Ashurst made uh, in the Levine case. You know, cases that happen in Connecticut ought to get decided in Connecticut. That's where the witnesses are. That's where the paperwork is. It's cheaper. It's faster. It's less dangerous. It's kind of the... What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas kind of argument. What happens here ought to be adjudicated by people here. Um, they, for some of these people, this comes from reading their text of their charter very literally. They read the charter and it doesn't say anything about the Privy Council, so by God, Privy Council shouldn't have any right of appeal. And here, you know, this is something where Maybe they're right and maybe they're wrong. Any of you guys who've taken a course on literature know that silence doesn't mean that there's no content there. Sometimes silence is indicative of a lot of content happening. It's very true, say, in poetry, right? Well, so one thing is the let's, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas argument. But another reason I think that they may have thought they'd get away with it is because England was heavily involved in a number of wars in the late 1600s and early 1700s. They, England was at war, or Europe was at war in the 1680s, the 1690s, the 1700s, the 1710s, for nearly 40 years running, 
the, there were a number of wars happening on European, the European continent, and I think some of these colonists thought, they're too busy. The government over there is too busy, and if we simply play this along, we're not going to get messed with. They won't bother with us. So this is where they kind of made their mistake, because it's in the 1680s and 1690s, and I'm coming to my conclusion very rapidly, um, that the English government began to try to crack down on piracy. This is the end of the golden age of piracy. For all of you who've seen you know, a movie like the Pirates of the Caribbean or whatever, in the 80s and 90s, piracy had meant a loss of revenue for the English government, loss of custom because of so much smuggling happening so many goods being sold by pirates to people who lived in, in seaports like New London, Connecticut, like places in Rhode Island, like Boston and Salem and Massachusetts. These were what people came to call pirate nests. They were nests of pirates, but also of people who supported them by buying their goods, by buying the stuff that the pirates had stolen. And in the 1690s, the Privy Council began to take very seriously, what are we going to do to crack down on these aiders and abettors who have been helping the pirates all along? And so at the same time that these men of Rhode Island and Connecticut and Massachusetts may have thought they were going to get by and nobody would notice what they were saying about no appeals to Privy Council, is exactly the wrong moment because it's exactly when the Privy Council is getting ready to put them under the microscope and examine their dealings with these lawbreakers. And so just at the moment when they might have hoped that there would be less intrusion in their business, they're going to get more intrusion in their business. And the governors and councils are going to come under increasing scrutiny, not just from England, but from colonists as well. There are going to be people in the colonial world who become really unhappy as more of these individuals are brought in from England. Fitz John Winthrop is a Connecticut man, but in a lot of royal colonies, many of the governors are gonna be sent in from England. They're gonna be outsiders. And some of their counselors are likewise gonna be men who are not local born. And for these people who are outsiders to be the top level of justice is gonna become a big complaint in the 1750s and 1760s and 1770s to the point that when we have the American Revolution, the state constitutions that get drawn up then will begin to cut out the judicial activities of governors and councils. In all but one case, um, and the exception is New York, in case you're wondering, um, in all but one case, the, colony, the colonies that become states and draft new state constitutions will get rid of the judicial power that's been handled for so long by governors and councils. And so I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions and answers about this talk, and I hope you have found yourself learning something from it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that fascinating talk. Um, I don't know if you can call it justice, but uh, a word that was sprinkled in there from the I became interested in legal history in the field when I was about your age. Um, I was, I, for a long time I thought I was going to law school. I was an English major and a history major and I was headed to law school. And then I took a class in my junior year from a na man named Bill Luchtenberg and he taught a class on legal history of the 1930s. And it was a seminar with about 12 people and I went into that classroom and after the first, it was like somebody, I'd walked into a dark room and all the lights were turned on suddenly. It's like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, I get it now. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Okay, so how do I get to be a legal historian? So that's how I started on the path. How I got to these people is when I was in graduate school, um, I took a seminar. I, I entered graduate school again thinking, well, I'm going to do 20th century legal history. I'm going to study... 
like the 1930s or 1940s, I'd written my senior thesis about the World War II Japanese-American internment cases. Again, with Dr. Luchtenberg, it was a great experience. I recommend writing a thesis for everybody. Um, and so I went to graduate school thinking I would do 20th century legal history. And I took a seminar with a professor named Bernard Balin. And that name won't mean very much except to historians. Exactly. If you were a historian, you would know that he's one of the greatest historians of the 20th century uh, who basically reshaped the field of American history before, say, 1865. It basically just turned it upside down and shook it upside, you know, it was like, and so I went in this classroom and again, it's like, oh, why am I bothering with the 20th century? That's really stupid. There are so many questions in the colonial period that we don't know answers to. Somebody's got to go find out the answers. And the more conversations I had with Professor Balin, the clearer it became that there were almost an infinite number of questions that we didn't have answers to in early American legal history. And so uh, it's a combination of those two classroom experiences that kind of pointed me towards, ultimately towards this topic. Yeah, great question, thank you very much. Uh, since you're doing some comparative work within the colonies, yeah. do you see a shift in places like Charleston or Savannah compared to Connecticut, or are they all rumbling around the same time with this issue? In South Carolina, they have a different problem. In South Carolina, the problem they've got by the 1720s is that the legislature makes an unusual choice. The unusual choice is that they decide to institute a salary for the justices who are going to be, the judges and justices who will be appointed to serve in South Carolina. And what this does is it gives an incentive to the English uh, nobility that are in the government to send over and appoint people who are their lackeys, people who, you know, they owe favors to. And so what happens in South Carolina is you get this influx of judges and justices who are Scots and Irish and English and have no ties at all to South Carolina. And what you get after the 1720s is colonial meltdown, uh, for lack of a better word. Really, um, the, the, folks are, the folks there are really put out that they effectively have been turned into what they think of as a dumping ground for all these guys who are outsiders in their justice system, and now they have no way to get rid of them. And other places like Massachusetts, they didn't pay their justices. Uh, and so there was no incentive for people in England to kind of try to dump judges on them. And so it's a different problem, but it leads in the same direction, which is dissatisfaction with England and dissatisfaction with their justice system. Exactly so. Exactly so. Thanks. Other thoughts for our guests this evening? Yes, ma'am. Well, the answer is one of them died. Um, it's John and Nicholas, and uh, if you ask me which one died, then I have a problem. Um, but uh, one of them did. Um, la, 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 la. John, John uh, died of Nicholas and John. John Hallam died um, back in 1701. And Nicholas stays on in England to pursue this lawsuit um, that's the Mohegan Indians theoretically against Connecticut. Um, but my understanding is eventually he returns to Barbados, uh, which is where his family's, his first fa the first father, um, the Hallam family line, that's where a lot of their wealth is generated. And so, if we're talking about Barbados, we're talking about slaves and sugar. And so a good guess is that they were involved in purchasing and using slave labor, and that they were probably involved in the sugar, the manufacture of sugar. Um, in this time period, sugar is a luxury item. Sugar is a terribly expensive item, and it is a wealth producing item. And so um, my guess is that they, he goes back to um, their, their roots in Barbados. Yes. Uh, 
now that I don't know. Um, the Hallams uh, were the sons of the, first, the, uh, the wife's first husband, but I'm not sure how old they were. Good question. Um, you might be able to find that out by looking on Ancestry.com if there are records from Barbados. I would search, if, they'd ha if they're suing in the 1680s or 90s, they're probably born no earlier than, say, 1620, and no later than about 1650. So I'd, I'd search in those areas, and you might be able to find the answer yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Another round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Hadley.